for the life of the world is a production of the Yale Center for Faith and Culture. Visit us online at faith.yale.edu. Human beings have always had this potential relation to the cosmos, which is profoundly fulfilling for them and in which they, I believe, they actually perceive something, not just projection, right? But what's surprising, what's disconcerting, is that the form this takes is so tremendously different from age to age, from culture to culture. So this leaves us with a huge puzzlement or uncertainty where to go with this, but it seems to me these two sides of my proposition are equally true. That there always is this invitation to some kind of connection, but that the issue or the invitation or the kind of form it takes and so on are just tremendously different and very often mutually impenetrable. I mean, we, we had great trouble understanding perhaps the way it works out in another time. This book is an invitation to explore further in this kind of way. And I think if we do, we will begin to understand how other peoples of the times have lived this to the great benefit of our relationship to them and their relationship to us, and as far as they still exist, but also to, you know, a very important part of understanding humanity. I mean, the philosophical anthropology that we end up with has to have a place for this, or it's obviously, you know, not doing its job. This is For the Life of the World, a podcast about seeking and living a life worthy of our humanity. I'm Evan Rosa with the Yale Center for Faith and Culture. Any day is a good day to take some cosmic perspective. You know, take that split second or a few deep breaths, stop whatever busy work or performance that you're up to, and just ask, how do we relate to everything else? How do we orient ourselves to the world outside of our heads? Now, maybe you shrug and move on, or maybe you stay with me for a few moments longer and get even more curious. One possibility is that we just are a part of the cosmos, inextricably bound to it, dependent on it, indeed made of it, and someday going back to it. But there's also a little fib in our heads. I'll leave its origins and causes aside for now, but there's this lie that we can sort of float above or outside of this natural order, hitchhiking and train hopping on the back of technological feats and the horrifyingly elegant speed of digital life. It's a kind of modern hubris, thinking that somehow detaching ourselves from the world gives us the power to transcend it. But it is a lie. We're embodied and bound to the earth, bound and dependent, but also wonderfully resonant and connected to it, if we would just notice. Maybe you get that resonance taking in a breathtaking view on a hike. Maybe you get it looking up close at the freckles in the iris of your child's eyes. Maybe, like me, you get it when you're completely surrounded and sometimes held under by the heave of the ocean. But articulating this connection to the cosmos seems to be getting harder. It's easier to articulate our autonomy, individuality, and independence. That's what makes the 92-year-old Canadian philosopher Charles Taylor so punk rock. In today's episode, Miroslav Wolf interviews Charles Taylor about his most recent work, a long-awaited book called Cosmic Connections, Poetry in the Age of Disenchantment. In it, he turns to poetry, particularly romantic poetry, to help articulate the human experience of the cosmos we are inextricably a part of. In the book, he writes, quote, We need a relation to the world, the universe, to things, forests, fields, mountains, seas, analogous to the relation we have to other human beings we love and works of art, where we feel ourselves addressed and called upon to answer. Together in this conversation, Miroslav and Charles discuss the modern enlightenment view of our relation to the world and its shortcomings, modern disenchantment and the prospects of re-enchantment through art and poetry, the readiness to experience the world and what it's always offering, how to hold the horrors of natural life with its transcendent joys. Charles recites some of William Wordsworth's Tintern Abbey and Gerard Manley Hopkins' The Windover. They talk about how to become fully arrested by beauty, what that does to us, 
and the value we find in the human experience of the world. Now, probably the best way to catch hold of what Charles is trying to do in Cosmic Connections is simply hear him recite and react to some poetry. Later, we'll hear him read some Wordsworth. But let's jump in with his reading of Gerard Manley Hopkins' poem, The Windover. I caught this morning, morning's minion, kingdom of daylight's dolphin, dappled dawn drawn falcon, his riding of the rolling level underneath in steady air, and striding high there, how he rung upon the rein of wimpling wing in his ecstasy. Then off, off, forth on swing, as a skate's heel sweeps smooth on a bow bowing. The hurl and gliding rebuffed the big wind. My heart in hiding stirred for a murder, the achievement, the mastery of the thing. So this very, you know, irregular rhythm is meant to capture what he calls the inscape, which is the inner force of every individual thing. It's a kind of theology behind that is a strange mixture of uh, realism, I mean, in the medieval sense, but also Don Scotus has the idea that each individual thing has its nature. And that's what really excited, uh, you know, Hopkins. And so he invented this extraordinary poetic rhythm, <laughs> which really arrests you, constantly stops you and sends you off again in order to, you know, make you feel. But you get a totally different relationship to this bit of the creation, which is a, a bird. Eh? You've got a different relationship to it if you're not just standing over against it, looking at it, but also you're caught up. You can't help following the, the, the what? Well, the basic impulse here. And that, of course, fits his theory of everything is, as an inscape, right? So you can think of it as revealing clearly the inscape, this form, right? If you read it, you live that experience in a different form, and therefore connecting in a different way with the world around. And it's very powerful and moving. So it's a, at once a look into the interior of things, what makes them act as they do, and something that deeply enthuses us, uh, lifts our spirits. Because we feel connected, connected in a way that we weren't before. We stand over against it, it's just something mm -hmm. moving. The sky is catching us inside. Listening to Charles read this and explain what the poem did in him it feels like witnessing exactly what he's trying to point to. You get the sense that he feels it in himself and is arguing from that experience, not just arguing from detached philosophical reflection. And that said, I hope you enjoy the rest of this conversation between Miroslav Wolf and Charles Taylor. Thanks for listening today. Charles, it is so wonderful to have you on our podcast, to have you discuss your wonderful book, uh, Cosmic Connections. This is the title of your book. The subtitle contains the word disenchantment. And the book is uh, about loss of connection to the world and about attempts to retrieve it above all through poetry. And the reason for the loss is signaled by the word disenchantment in the subtitle. Can you sketch mm -hmm. for our listeners a little bit what you mean by disenchantment? The basic thesis underlying the book is that human beings have always had this potential relation to the cosmos, which is profoundly fulfilling for them, and in which they, I believe, they actually perceive something, not just projection, right? Yeah. Well, the word, of course, refers to Weber's and so on, but it's, it's caught on. And there's a big mistake in Weber, I think, which is unfortunately copied. So I use it with some trepidation because it includes too much, too many different things. It includes the decline of religion, for instance, 
but it also includes the fading of this thing I'm talking about, cosmic connections. It includes the end of magic, which is really close to the etymology of the word, and in English as well as in German. And the thing is that there's a lot of good and bad in all of these disconnections. And if you take it as a whole, you're in danger of thinking they're all the same and they're all either good or bad. <laughs> and plainly, the development of modern medical science is a very good thing. <laughs> but I would also say that the total insensitivity to the connection with the cosmos is bad. It's a bad thing. And we it's not only bad because it's a deprivation of a human fulfillment. It's bad because it lies behind our terrible behavior, which are ruining our not just the planet, but our very future and uh, the tremendous difficulty we have in changing course around that. So I'm saying this because I've already had a couple of reactions to the subtitle. (laughs) Does that mean you wouldn't go to a doctor? (laughs) And and in a sense, it suggested that kind of re-enchantment might be the solution to the problem. And when I think of the word uh, re-enchantment, obviously you mentioned it has so many different connotations, disenchantment, but then also re-enchantment. When I think about it, I'm walking through the the forest. I think about a Grimm's fairy tale about Hansel and Gretel. They walk through the forest and see this, um, that's all a kind of paradigmatic enchantment enchanted uh, space and they see this really wonderful house that is that's beautiful and that's made of sugar and they want to eat it. I immediately think about Adam and Eve in paradise, the tree of life, good for food and delight for, for the eyes. And I'm wondering, well, is re-enchantment uh, a, a kind of safe, safe space to be, so to speak? But uh, uh, you, you're, you're speaking in some ways uh, what I think maybe, but uh, let me ask you, are you speaking what Lukash had in mind when he spoke about Verdinglichung, uh, a kind of thingification of the world, uh, a world being rendered mute, a pure object, rather than there being any more personal kind of connection with the world. Exactly. I mean, that's one of the many strands in what Weber has called disenchantment. Yeah. Uh, and why I doubt about it, and now I feel remorse about using that in the subtitle, is that it covers a lot of other stuff, too. Yeah. And I took it for granted that somebody who read would see that it's very much aiming at a certain dimension of connection or disconnection with the, with the cosmos. And <clears throat> But maybe it's a mistake to put something in the subtitle that it requires that you read the book. <laughs> 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 no, but I think for anybody who does read the book, it becomes pretty soon clear what, what you're after. Hartmut Rosa, whose book Resonance, you praise in your book, speaks about the kind of feature of the modern world. And I, I think he puts it under the rubric of acceleration, kind of the internal logic of always, always more that does not allow us to have this resonant relationship with the world. How much is something like that uh, in the forefront of your view? Oh, very much so, yeah. I mean, because uh, the the whole revision I'm talking about, the sense of connection, is a kind of art of resonance. I mean, I agree with you that the concept needs further elaboration, which he's trying to do with the concept of uh, there are different axes of resonance. And the axis here is the one of our relation to the world, in which which is no longer resonant. That's not part of what the relationship consists in. I'm, I'm being very general. But people who adopt this very much positive view of modernity in all its aspects, it is a relation which is more and more one of thinking the world as an object that can be used in various ways, and there's something disastrous in this. So, I, in a certain when I read Hartman's <laughs> book, an earlier book actually, which was exploring this, I, you know, I left that worry to introduce people to what's what I want to talk about. A part of this idea, I think, for Hartmut as well, but more generally, one side of it is 
kind of the muteness of the world. And one might ask, why is the world become mute? And some of it is it might have to do with us seeing the world through the eyes of sciences, where it becomes sometimes perceived as an object. Part of it uh, may be because we look at it through the, the perspective of utility and then the idea that the world is always an instrument. There's an instrumental relationship and the inherent value is missing. To what extent do you think that defines the problem, this world not having, or things in the world yeah. not having inherent value, but they're always seen in terms of inst instrumental value? Yeah, I think that's absolutely essential. There's a very amusing anecdote in Tocqueville's Democracy in America, where he goes up to the, what, the North East and so on, it's very, still very wild. And he looked at these forests and his red shadow looking on it. But he meets some people who are loggers there and they can't understand. They're very suspicious. They think he's going to go cut into there. And he tries to explain <laughs> no, no, no. That's not what it's all about. But they can't get their minds around that that could be yeah. what it was all about. Now, I think that illustrates something very, very deep. If you, you can develop, you can build intellectually a belief in modern science, et cetera, and that could be it. But you can build also in your, practical existence, this kind of a relationship where you know, if you duty forget it, we want to chop this down in order to get stuff for building and make our living. And certainly, I think that's a, always a danger, but the whole modern mindset encourages people to carry on like that. Maybe we start from something with which people are familiar, namely Anne Dillard. Yeah, what's surprising, what's disconcerting, and this is what I raised in the last chapter, is that the form this relation to the cosmos, to the heaven, takes is so tremendously different from age to age, from culture to culture. And that's why in the last chapter, I throw in a lot of things like, you know, contemporary, like Annie Dillard, but at the same time, I speak about Aboriginal spiritualities and so on. I mention some in the Canadian context. and. And so this leaves us with a huge puzzlement of uncertainty, where to go with this. But it seems to me these two sides of my proposition are equally true, that there always is this invitation to some kind of connection, but with the kind of you know, form it takes and so on are just tremendously different and very often mutually impenetrable. I mean, we, we have great trouble understanding uh, perhaps the way it works out in another time, though this book is an invitation to explore further. And I think if we do, we will begin to understand how other peoples of the times have lived this to the great benefit of our relationship to them <laughs> and their relationship to us, and as far as they still exist, but also to, you know, a very important part of understanding Humanity. I mean, the philosophical anthropology that we end up with has to have a place for this, or it's obviously, you know, not doing its job. So at, uh, at the very end in this chapter on uh, that includes uh, Dillard's um, Pilgrim uh, at the Tinker Creek, you talked about her writings invite or, or lead us to something like the readiness to resonate with the creation. And you distinguish this readiness to resonate with actual experiences of of resonance. And so her writing uh, prepares us for it. Can you articulate a little bit more this distinction between readiness and what does it take for us as we are today to become ready to see yeah. something that otherwise remains close to us? Yeah, it's, it's this readiness. And the readiness... Yeah, part of it is that it's something we're on the threshold of being prepared for. Because we've had certain feelings and certain moments that we didn't maybe follow up. Feelings of awe, feelings of wonder, feelings of, of connection, which we didn't follow up and try to follow up. And you do transform these, these initial vague intuitions, you transform them and make them more powerful by identifying them. I mean, her her picking out of the light on the water and so on. Uh, you know, I imagine uh, what that, that's like, and it's, I've had experiences like that, and it makes me stop and think about them, stop and look at them in a way that <clears throat> I wouldn't have before. 
So in some sense, also what she does is maybe what a good photography can do. Yeah. Freeze in a given moment, a, a particular form of experience of which one becomes then aware and is ready to recognize it again and then actually resonate. Yeah. yeah. So when, when you talk about uh, Dillard, and I'm going to ask now a question about her, but also more broadly about, about the book. What seems to be highlighted in, in her work, this arresting images that you have just described, the question then becomes, does that highlight an aspect of our experience of nature, but hides something else? And the reason why I'm going there is I have recently been immersed in Arthur Schopenhauer. And uh, his rather pessimistic reading of the world, and I might imagine that his response to uh, Anne Dillard would be, uh, which is what he says about some of the r romantic descriptions of nature, it's like they think that's a peep show. Uh, and so they highlight certain interesting features of it, so certain aspects with which we easily resonate and forget what's going on actually in the nature itself. And, you know, his example is you see the image of lion chasing the gazelle and you can think of it as an aesthetic experience, but you can put yourself in the position of lion. You can put yourself in the position of gazelle. And if you're in a position of gazelle, then suddenly this whole thing looks like a horror show. So how does one integrate into these experiences of resonance with nature, kind of the horror that underlies uh, this. Yeah. Milos uh, has uh, emphasized some of that in his poetry. Yeah. I mean, well, that's a very interesting question. I don't think I really have the answer to it. I mean, the, the proper answer to it would be to be able to take on board those terrible features of the line and the, and the, and the gazelle and still be unshaken from the deep sense of, of resonance and tell the to take that on board, not to approve of it, to not be shaken in some way by it, but to have a sense that there's something there which transcends that. I mean, anyway, Schopenhauer, of course, has this notion of when you see a real work of art, you get on the vision that goes beyond that, right? Yeah, so yeah. in a certain sense, he's on this, you know, he has his own version of what he would otherwise criticize in others. But but that demands a lot. I mean, uh, that you would be able to enfold in the same contemplation, in the same sense, in the same knowledge of both these aspects. It's easy for the, the blood to wipe out, to sponge. But... Uh, it would be a mistake to let that be covered over by or set aside by, because there is some real connection here, potential connection, which I think is something deeply sought by us, therefore the human fulfillment, and also which is a, a necessary condition of, though not sufficient, of the proper relationship to nature, the planet, life around us. In in your brief comments on Dostoevsky, especially one of the speeches of Zosima, where he gives uh, account of experiences of his brother, which became then an opening for himself to to experience something similar, you speak about this this larger, more serious sense of the need of uh, almost inner transformation to be able yeah. to uh, appreciate nature. And I'm thinking uh, of Zosima himself then, when he speaks about loving even the sinner's sin, and immediately after that goes loving everything in the nature or uh, nature notwithstanding whatever is found in it that, that may not be very lovable. But that's a, almost like a discipline that one has to have uh, a stance toward rather than simply something being elicited in us by nature itself. Yeah, uh, that's absolutely right. And I wanted to introduce that because I didn't want to make the book seem as if it was claiming that this kind of vision was always uh, induced by poetry. On the contrary, it can be induced by something very different. I mean, uh, in the case of the brother, uh, it wasn't introduced by any poetic line that either he or anyone else, uh, but it is a really moral slash theological 
vision, which crashed in on him, right? And yeah. that's what Tosina picks up. And then, and then it's really the, one of the central messages of the book I take. Uh, I mean, I read the, the brothers in that, in that sense. So I wanted to make clear that I wasn't talking about all kinds of breaking in, breakings in of new visions. I was talking about the particular ones that are brought on by uh, art and by particularly poetry. And that's exactly how this poetry works. It's not a philosophical argument that there's a voice running through all things, but you have strong experience of that. And because it is so meaningful to you, you've got a sense of joy of being connected in that way. Another piece of poetry that Charles chose to read and work through was a portion of Tintern Abbey by William Wordsworth. Here's his recitation. So this is the Tintern Abbey, right? I have felt the presence that disturbs me with the joy of elevated thoughts, a sense sublime of something far more deeply interfused, whose dwelling is the light of setting suns, and the round ocean and the living air and the blue sky, and in the mind of man, a motion and a spirit that impels all thinking things, all objects of thought, and rolls through all things. Now, my claim is that here, you get to feel that, right? a sense of that happening. As against, I simply in a monotone voice say that there's a, you know, there's a force that's a, impels all things. You get a really feel for it. You see it coming at you. You are the mind of man and it's running through all things towards you. So it's a, a powerful sense. But in some sense, even even in, in poetry that came out, uh, especially in, in treatment of Milos, but I have loved uh, a poem of by Rilke that you, that, that you quoted. And the last stanza of that uh, poem is, I care and in me stands the house. I protect yeah. myself, and in me is the protection. Beloved that I became, on me rests the image of a beautiful creation, and then this stunning line, and weeps itself out. <laughs> and, and so, so you, you do have this almost Zosima sense of the, or, or even in some sense, Schopenhauer sense of, of, of creation that is, uh, yeah. groaning under its own suffering and weight. And the human yeah. being is not there simply to observe uh, or to complain or to uh, even do something, but, uh, but, but they're first and foremost to have compassion, to understand, to let the creation weep itself on, on one. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I was struck by it and I thought, wow, my, it's such a, such a different way of perceiving uh, our relationship to the world. Yeah, and and it's not the one that I associate most of the time with Richard. Yeah, I mean, I think what we're really aiming at, we get in the, to me, crowning elegies, which I think are seven and nine, which is a kind of vision, and this is very close to another aspect of theology, vision of glory, right? Elegy, mm. right? Right? And uh, it was a question of my reading something. I might later on, if I do, I want to read that passage in the seventh elegy. So there is, this is something that you don't just discover, but that you realize in poetry. And I think the elegy is right for place where, and I think in the seventh and the ninth, you have passages. But there's no sense here of compassion. There's a mm -hmm. sense of, Heroes and is hellish. I mean, here to be here is glorious. Right, right. So I'm puzzled by that because a lot of Ritka is close to close to Christianity, first of all, mm. and close to that kind of that invocation of compassion, which is very close to Christian theology. Right? 
Yeah. On the contrary, it goes in this other direction. Uh, that was completely. Exactly. Well, maybe, maybe I'm misreading it completely. What he's trying to do right here, but this Innenwelt, the the world with, within, uh, se- seems to uh, carry with it at least this possibility. And maybe my imagination was triggered not just by Schopenhauer, but also recently I've, I've read in Bruno Latour's book After Lockdown. And he talks there about, you know, uh, after lockdown coming out, uh, I I suppose, uh, and then not being able to relate to uh, anything around with ease, except the moon. Because when he looks at the sun, uh, he thinks of global global warming. When he looks about the fields, he he thinks, why aren't poppies in the wheat? Uh, What have been done to these fields that there are like that? And so it it goes in introductory introductory comments. And, And there's a kind of sense of guilt also in relationship yeah. to, to nature, to what we have done to it that requires stances that aren't simply uh, a kind of Herrlichkeit uh, and being taken into something uh, of the beauty of the nature. Yeah. Yes, that's right. And But uh, being paradoxically, I believe, an absolutely essential instrument to fight against this kind of destruction of the planet is this kind of perception of an arresting kind of beauty that moves us very deeply in, which we begin to cherish as part of our our lives. So I think that, you know, in a sense, if we could get into a kind of loop where we were so horrified at what we're doing that we don't feel we have the right to feel anything but the horror. Yeah. But that may be scoring an own goal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Zosima actually might be interesting in this regard because he has almost this this, uh, twofold vision, uh, one at the same time. And one can see it in other religious uh, thinkers where something of deep value has been perceived uh, as a human being, but also the sin of that human being is recognized also some kind of fr- uh, deep fragility uh, and the problematic character of, of, of things. Uh, and one can affirm both. And in a sense, that becomes a motivator to to be engaged with, uh, with the phenomenon. Yeah, yeah. And otherwise you are, if you just concentrate on the positive resonance, you're in a certain sense uh, fooling yourself that that, because that exists along with yeah. destruction, guilt, I mean, responsibility for destruction, and all these. So it's a real achievement, which the book doesn't claim any progress on. It's a real achievement to take it all in and not have the really best up destroy your appreciation of the beauty. Right? So it's an achievement we ought to aim at because it's part of our essential part of our getting over the very sick and bad relation that we're in to nature and the planet and so on. But it could look simply self-indulgent and you know, ignoring the bad. I was so fascinated by this line from Milos, living in the rose. I think that that, that seems like, like this but both articulates kind of the, the pleasantness of this attraction to the beauty that it is, but also there, there's certain reality and falsity about it uh, at the yeah. same time. And he doesn't let you stay in the rose, right? You're shutting out all this bad stuff yeah. and not only allowing that it exists. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, I'll be a great poet of the 20th century, I think, you know, astonishing that he really had an effect. He really changed history. It's uh, something very wrong. Do you think this, um, I mean, I'm going back to this a dual vision that he has as well, uh, both the t- tragedy, but also the possibilities uh, that, yeah. that are there. And then he thinks both uh, at the same time. Uh, I find it in the Christian faith, but I also read folks like, I think you, uh, with Dreyfus and Kelly, have, you've, you've probably seen their small book, um, All Things Shining. Yes, yes. Which I think is a, it's a wonderfully written book, 
but it, it has a kind of pretty radical critique of the Christian uh, theology, and basically it, it's, its idea is uh, God is the ultimate value, uh, and therefore instead of God kind of imbuing the world with value, God sucks it, up, uh, sucks it away. Uh, because uh, you ought to value God rather than creation. And so that there's this competitive relationship between God and creation that, that is identified. And the same uh, is true of my colleague here at Yale, Martin Heglund, in his book, This Life. That there again is this competitive relationship as if the divine and uh, the human and the created cannot be loved at the same time and love precisely creation because it's God's. I know. I mean, there's this blindness, I think, to a lot of very central facets of Christian faith. But it's also been spread and, and authenticated by the behavior. Yeah. So, I mean, there's something really, to me, so totally wrong with taking these people as the the spokespeople you know, authentically giving the demands of what arises from Christian faith it just seems to me to be wildly wrong. But uh, you, it doesn't seem to be possible to stop people who are outside the faith altogether from picking up the impressions by you know, that kind of politics as against from what you and I would say as being the proper to description of Christian faith. And you point out in your analysis of Milosh also that, that it's a particular form of Christianity that he stands for and very self-consciously stands uh, for in contrast to other options available. Yeah. yeah. But he really struggled with his Christian faith and the struggle is always there. That's really what, I mean, Father Holmsky, right, is the, the one who gave religious instruction back then in the 30s in Jinmo, in right? Um, mm. was, so his whole Christian faith seems to be, to be, seems to me to be constantly attempting to set that aside, break through that, and something more authentic, as he found. As I mentioned to you, I, I wanted to talk to you briefly also about uh, Hartmut Rosas. Uh, work, yeah, uh, especially his concept of uh, resonance, and to what extent uh, you, you find it helpful, and where do you see the limits of the resonance concept? Well, I think it has to be further developed, and the attempts that Hartman is making is his different forms of resonance, because because plainly the concept is simply stretched too far. If you include relationships of love with somebody else, uh, a sense of glory looking at the universe, a sense you know of other kinds of resonance, and what we're going to think about this concept after we worked out what these different axes, as he calls them, have, maybe it's going to be a kind of capstone over the whole lot, but the important discoveries need to be made in these different axes, right? I think that certain axes really moved him, and the word resonance seemed to be the right word to use here, including obviously in relationship to nature. But uh, you could say at the end of the day, when we've worked out what these different axes are, what do we have to say about the, the or overarching concept of resonance, will we still have the same the same concept or maybe another word or further distinctions and so on? I think it's it's all this is a work in progress as I see it. There is a there's a particular reason for my being very enthusiastic, which is one of the areas that the term covers. That uh, we're both members of a group that anyway used to be in Prague and well, after reconstituted, I'm sure it's being reconstituted after the, uh, the pandemic in May or something, the critical theory, right? Mm -hmm. Now, greater part of critical theorists are followers of not so much Marx now, but Habermas and so on, right? And there is no place there for, as was well part of the cornerstone or the criteria of critical theory, Anything but very, very important area, the area of 
relations within polity and relations that are defensible as against exploitative and so on. Very, very, very important. What there isn't in that majority view is a sense of what I call ethics. That is, the something is the right thing to do and the right thing to be because it's a, a deep fulfillment of what it is to be human. Right? This sort of Aristotle was against Kant. Right? Yeah, yeah. And, and so I'm constantly <laughs> having arguments with with Jorge and others and so on about about this. You know, leaving out something tremendously important. Mm-hmm. And um, they say, all oh, can't take Aristotle away. So I can see in Hartman's, and Hartman and I are very much uh, sort of allies in this, these discussions when we get together. In he wrote a dissertation and, on you, wasn't, didn't he? Way back, yeah. Um, and with actually somebody that was a doctor father that was very much in, in the Habermas mm. realm, but very interesting work too. So it's in that context, the context of that struggle that I want to, in our conception of ethics and morals, I want to, I think it's a distinction there. We can use the two words separately. Morals concerns the rules of what we should do to each other and what we shouldn't do to each other. So, so the Ten Commandments, and the, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights are good articulation of morals. But there's something crucial missing here, including when we think of the goods concerned with human relations, because they, well, uh, put it in, in theological terms, it's not just enough to treat people right. What you need is a powerful sense of real love for human beings. And there's something not only that makes you behave not fully morally if you lack it, there's there's something to do with the fullness of human life, right? So when I see people, when I, of course, when you see uh, Christ in the the New Testament, but when I see people around me who have this real sense of compassion for human beings and are activated by it, I see some real important fulfillment that makes human life fuller, better, uh, even regardless of the consequences, something valuable in it for itself. And I think a lot of present-day political discussion just marginalizes that. In the sense, Rosa picks up aspects of it with resonances. Would that be, would be, that be right? Yeah. yeah, that's right. That's his route into not yeah. being satisfied. Yeah. So, so my, my question partly partly about resonance was he he, he theorizes it as episodic, uh, and but not as a kind of state. And it would seem to me that some kind of relationship more than just as you put it here, readiness for something and experience something has to be also had in terms of resonance. There must be levels of resonance. When I think, for instance, when I go to my home, and if I like my home chair in which I sit or whatever it is, uh, this is not really, according to his definition of resonance, this is not really resonance. This is not episodic. I can anticipate it. I can come. I don't control it strictly. But nonetheless, I sit in that chair, I touch the chair, uh, and I feel I am... somehow in sync in a in a relatively low key kind of a kind of a way and it seems to me that 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 element needs to be there both in relationship to nature uh, and to the world at, at large um and to our particular um habitations or particular experiences that we have in the world so i mean that's one of the very important issues that needs to be worked out is the concept bias very resonances by by you know bias what it invokes in us, narrowing it that concept to the point where similar phenomena, which are also very important, get ignored, get yeah. forgotten. Do you think it, it, it is able to integrate um, something like agape, something like the need to be with, notwithstanding yeah. the brokenness uh, 
uh, of, of, of that for which you have love? Yeah, yeah. And so, also that restorative power for both yeah. partners of both agents in this relation. Yeah, restorative power. Now, what kind of modification at the end of the day would that involve for the concept of resonance to, mm. to incorporate that is a very good question. I mean, it's, it's, I still see it as a research program. It's a research, I mean, our thinking out of program, articulating. Right, right. And a very good one. I was so excited when I read the book. You mentioned your distinction between ethic, ethics and morality. I don't know whether you know that we here at Yale about 10 years ago have started teaching this class called Life Worth Living. Uh, and, and it really is a kind of pluralistic approach to uh, a kind of a sense what kind of life is truly worthy of our humanity. It's not simply about means to life. It's not simply about rules uh, to life. It is about uh, what constitutes us as human beings. And uh, I think it was your terminology. How do we grow into the fullness, into the fullness of that? How do you, how would you relate what you do in Cosmic Connection to this uh, particular question, uh, the question of human, human fullness, or in our terms, of life that is truly worth our humanity, worth the living? I think it's a, that kind of connection is a paradigm example of a very important element or dimension of precisely this. What's a really worthwhile life? What is a really full human life? That's another way of looking at the yeah. Aristotle, the Aristotelian type of perspective. What is it? Is, is this a feature of the really full, fulfilled human life? And, you know, I very much think it is. So that's a, that's one of the reasons for looking into it <laughs> yeah, at this length. And I, but I mean, it's two things. It's, it is one of those, and it's very much neglected by all sorts of people. I, like the, I mean, the loggers that Dorfield met. What's important is furthering economic progress, but also earning money, feeding our families, and so on. The purely utilitarian relationship to the forest was all that really uh, impinged on them. It's really, really important. And what was another another standpoint? I'm really very influenced by Shadow Berio, writer who wrote about you know the the not just his own journey to America, where the sense of awe and wonder is, is really of the romantic period, very, very important for him, right? So uh, I'm passionately <laughs> for not squeezing out this intrinsic fulfillment dimension from our understanding of what it is to be human and what is it to be a good human, which is, you know, it's, it's a danger in that the two. The two mistakes, uh, the mistake of looking at the world purely instrumentally and the mistake of looking at our moral lives purely in terms of the issue of who does what to whom and what they have a right to do. I think these are two mistakes that strengthen each other, that connect together. Do you think that part, part of the problem is uh, what you've described in, uh, in one of your earlier small books, uh, a certain misconception about ethics of authenticity, a kind of sense that uh, my good is uh, my private simply good, that authenticity can be defined by myself, and therefore what I need always is a multiplicity of means in order to get to be able to do in the moment I need to live authentic life. I can, I can do, or when the dreams that I have change, I can always have resources uh, in order to live that kind of a life. I think Hartmut Rosa has analyzed the problem in those terms. He uses this uh, in resonance book. He uses this analogy of a painter who obsesses with means with a uh, studio, with paints and brushes and everything else and never really gets to paint and sees that almost as a kind of window in, into cultural predicament in which we find ourselves. Yeah. But what I also want to say in that finding my own path is not something I do completely on my own. And it would just be impossible. But what, I, what we all need to find our own path is sympathetic interlocutors who may have a totally different uh, vocation in life or direction. 
But what we need is someone who can. I mean, I'm thinking today of a really crying need uh, on the part of young people, teenagers, particularly rendered worse by the pandemic, who don't have somebody to talk to, to sort of work out what's what they'd really like to do. So they have this sense that there's something missing in their lives, but they don't know what it is. And what they need, above all, is a sympathetic, obviously older, would be very good, interlocutor that can kind of ask them, you know, well, what do you feel close to? What kind of things interest you? And so on. Get them to be able to bring out and articulate. And that can make a huge difference. I mean, a great sense of pull over life that there's nothing, I don't, don't see where to go with this, nothing seems meaningful, can be actually alleviated by that. What we need is more interlocutors, yet that young people can speak to. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm going a little bit too far on the point, but the point being that uh, it's not a kind of egoism for concern simply with my own inventions, which is involved in their dearly and insight that people have different uh, vocations, if you like. It's very much something which has got to be worked out between. And as you have shown, actually in the act itself of formulating it for oneself, it already involves so much cultural dialogue that has that has already occurred. But my question to you now, as you speak about this interlocutors, and it's relevant for, for the course that we are that we are teaching, don't we need to have a, a, a right kinds of interlocutors? Because I can imagine interlocutors who are simply processing the dream. Uh, with, with the person without illuminating that uh, dream in any significant way. I think in particular of a person who was a student in one of our classes, um, a girl from India, uh, and who after we first time taught the class, we wanted to find out how we did and because we wanted to teach it uh, again. And then she said this in the class, this is the first time that I was given permission to take with intellectual seriousness the great question of what is the purpose of my life? Who ought I be? All the intellectual energy was always diverted for her to important questions, apparently, that matter. That is to say, how do we achieve this or that goal that we are setting our, ourselves? How do we get proper means to achieve the ends that we deem somehow important? But this this other question was not even not even us. So our purpose is somehow to validate the intellectual effort to be placed in that. Uh, and of course, your life is a testimony of how much intellectual effort is necessary and, and can be spent to explore just those kinds of issues. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but that's extremely important. That giving a donate a say giving the right to speak to other or, or the inviting them to speak for themselves yeah, yeah. and not creating an atmosphere kind of fear or sense in an advance that they're going to be laughed at or that they're going to be dismissed or you know well, I congratulate you for this class you you managed to create lots of well, in, in a sense, also to to expose them uh, to various alternatives to which people have devoted centuries of deep reflection so, so that they don't have to come de novo uh, and invent something, but, but, but they can they can learn from uh, deep wisdom of various traditions that are, that are there. Charles, as always, it's a beautiful thing and rewarding thing having a conversation with you. Thank you for taking the time to talk to us, but thank you also for taking the time to write this book and so many books before. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed this conversation too, very much. of the World is a production of the Yale Center for Faith and Culture at Yale Divinity School. This episode featured Charles Taylor and Miroslav Wolf. Production assistance by Emily Brookfield, Alexa Rallo, Casey Barrett, and Zoe Halliban. I'm Evan Rosa, and I edit and produce the show. 
For more information, visit us online at faith.yale.edu or lifeworthliving.yale.edu, where you can find all sorts of resources, podcasts, articles, books, and so much more that help people envision and pursue lives worthy of our humanity. If you're new to our show, remember to hit subscribe in your favorite podcast app so you don't miss an episode. And to our loyal supporters and our faithful listeners, would you tell a friend or share an episode? Here's just a few ideas. You can hit the share button for this episode and send it as a text or an email to a friend, or you can put it in your social feed with a cool reflection. Second, you can give us an honest rating in Apple Podcasts or Spotify. How are we doing? Scale one out of five. Finally, you could write a short review of the show in Apple Podcasts or Spotify. These reviews are extra special because they help like-minded people get an idea for what we're all about, but we also read these and take the advice to heart. Thanks for listening, friends. We'll be back with more soon. Thank you.